Hello and welcome to the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings. This is the story of 66, a celebration of the brand new album from the legend that is singer, songwriter and musician Paul Weller. This new series features podcast conversations with many of the huge talents that have been involved in the creation of Paul's 17th solo studio album. What I hope is that these podcasts give you a deeper insight into the creation of the new LP and that sheer joy of the creative process. And ultimately, it all comes back to the songs. What you'll hear about this LP, probably more than any other, is an album packed full of collaboration. Welcome to the story of 66. It's an absolute delight to welcome back a very special guest to the podcast. Last heard on episode 170 of series one. This fellow has been creating music for nearly as long as Paul Weller, to be honest with you. The band, the Blow Monkeys, the talent that is Dr. Robert on the podcast. We're going to talk about this beautiful Radio 2 record of the week, Rise Up Singing, where it started with Monks Road Social, how it became a single and a part of the album, 66 from Paul Weller. You've heard Paul's angle on it. Well, let's hear from Dr. Robert. Plus, we'll also talk about on the day of release, we have a brand new Blow Monkeys album out in the world, an album called Together Alone, or is it? Could be Together forward slash alone. And this desire to create, to push forward, to give us new music. It's an absolute blast to dig into more stories from this fella. Let's get into it. Dr. Robert, thanks for joining me. My pleasure, Dan. Nice to see you. You too. It feels like we've seen each other quite recently, but there's still so much to catch up on, which is lovely. Well, yeah, I mean, you are now the world's Paul Weller number one encyclopedia specialist. So uh, it's a pleasure to share the uh, screen with you once more. Let's talk Rise Up Singing then. We'll kick off with this lovely song, which has been Radio 2 Record of the Week. I don't know if you see all this in Spain. Do you see the kind of accolades for the singles? Yeah, of course I do. You know, okay. I'm on the bloody internet and I can't help it. I might see it pops up on my phone all the time. And it's, it's great. Yeah, it's, it's, I've seen this done really well. And that's really nice to see. Actually, Paul sent me a, a WhatsApp as he does. Was it two, one of those 2am ones again? <laughs> yeah, 2am. And also, I'm an hour ahead here, so it's even later for me. <laughs> You're practically getting <laughs> up when they come yeah yeah. Uh, yeah absolute radio song of the week i mean brilliant but let's talk yeah. about where the song started because it was originally part of your monks road social projects and, yeah. and for those that don't know and can't be bothered to dig into our previous conversation just give me a quick summary of what monks road social is explain what it is and how it works if that's all right uh, a guy called richard clark approached me a few years ago now and said he wanted to put together some compilations he liked my songs could we get other people singing my songs could we get musicians together so i was able to get like all, the, all my friends you know, like Mick Talbot, Crispin, Jacko, Ernie McCone, everyone just to come and have a weekend down at Mono Valley down in Wales. That was the first one we did. Basically with my songs and then we started to bring other songs in. So by the time we got to the third album, I was working with a guy called Miles Copeland, who's not the police guy, but um, Miles, who's, who runs his own label, Wonderful Sound. So I was working with him and he, he often comes with little ideas. He gave me this little loop. We just had these two chords on it. And I kind of responded to that. This was in the lockdown. So I had a lyric for Rise Up Singing that was kind of about the whole... What we'd lost in lockdown was that communal spirit, that communal thing about it. It could be in a football ground. It could be in a concert. That thing where you lose yourself and you suddenly find that you're part of something bigger. And it might... And it often involves singing. I mean, you, uh, I've been to Anfield, right? I'm a Chelsea fan, right? But like Paul, but I love Liverpool. And when you hear those guys singing, it's an out there experience, an out of body experience. And I mean, I saw it recently when Klopp left, you know, the emotion of being able to see, you've got to have a good song. You Never Walk yeah. Alone is a good song. It certainly beats God Save the Queen or King. As Chelsea fans, we don't seem to have many of those. No, Blue is the colour, doesn't quite cut it, does it? <laughs> no. It's not quite on the same level. So, but, but that emotion of being in, you know, where else would you get 20, 30,000 people singing in harmony like that? In unison. So there was something about that spirit that we'd lost that obviously we weren't able to do. That's and that's a human need. That's a human connection. So that's where the, the lyric came from. You know, I wanted to get Paul involved on the, on that last month's word one. So I sent him out. I think I had sung a bit. I had the choruses and I was singing that kind of backing thing. And I had a few ideas for verses, but he asked me just to send him just with the chorus. He used some of my words, but he used his own words too. And then used his own melodies and stuff. And I loved what he was, I loved what he did to it. So we did a version that came out on Monk's Road. But Monk's Road wasn't really, it was kind of like a cult thing. It wasn't, it didn't really get across. And I think he felt that the song was stronger 
than that and it deserved it better. So he all went away and he put loads, I mean, put beautiful strings on it. I think he did them at Abbey Road, didn't he? The whole thing just came up, you know, a whole level when he when he when he mixed it with Charles and did his thing on it. Beautiful guitar. So yeah, I was really chuffed. I didn't expect it would be a single and I didn't I had no idea it would do this well. So I'm really pleased for him because it was uh, he's done a great job on it. Well, the Monks Road social thing is great because as a Weller fan, there's so much Weller alumni, uh, like Mick Tolby mentioned, Steve Wyatt, Jack O'Peak, Matt Dayton, people like yeah. that as well involved. Yeah. And there are uh, four fabulous albums, which I encourage. And the packaging is so beautiful on these things. Yeah. I mean, you can't make a penny from these things, Robert. <laughs> no, well, I don't know. I mean, but I don't think Richard does either because Richard's a fan. Richard is a, you know, he's not in the music business. He was a businessman. He just happened to be a massive music fan. And I think he wanted to put out these beautifully packaged compilations of some of his favourite musicians playing together. I mean, it's as simple as that, you know. So it was a joy for me to do because, you know, down the years I know all these guys, you know, and inevitably it was leading to getting Paul involved, I think, at the end of it. Yeah. But, I, you know, we had to do a few albums to get there, I think. <laughs> and, uh, but it was great fun, you know. I mean, I'll be honest, from a personal point of view, I love producing. There's nothing better than hearing someone else singing a song either. So, you know, some of the stuff that we did with people, you know, some of the kind of more obscure songs of mine, well, there were a lot of the solo stuff's pretty obscure, to be honest, was uh, it was a joy to hear it come to life and sung by someone else. It was great fun. And then might, we might do more. I don't know. I need to speak to Richard. We might do some more, yeah. Oh, fingers crossed on that. Fingers crossed yeah. on that. So what you sent Paul then was, so is there another version in your notebook of what these lyrics are in your head, what this song was going to be in your mind? I've got a demo that I did. Uh, it was a very different kind of way of doing it. But um, I think Paul kept some of the words, but then he added his own thing. But he sang it in totally his own way. He came up with his own melodies in the verses and stuff like that. And the chorus, the way he kind of reacted to the chorus and, and sang back to it was all his. And I think, you know, I mean, I heard Paul's interview with you um, I agree with one thing that he said about, you know, we're all a little bit fucked up and it's much easier to do things by WhatsApp. And that's true. I mean, we've known each other for, for a long, long time. And we sit and play guitar together. We used to do that and stuff like that. But actually writing together, when you're used to writing on your own and you're in the same room with somebody, can be a little bit awkward, even now. Because you're kind of used to having it all your own way, but when it, when you sort of when there's a slight dislocation and you're sending half an idea by WhatsApp and this and, and someone can either you don't get upset if someone says oh, it's not going to work or so, you know there's no kind of ego involved. It's actually a really nice way of doing it. Nice, and he's done that a lot on this album as well. I think on this yeah. this sixty six, there's only what you would say like three songs that are Paul Weller written. Total Paul Weller. Everything yeah. else is a co writer collaboration, which is great. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's great. I think that's a new place to go. As Paul's ever always searching, we all are as writers not to repeat ourselves. And one of the things when you're younger is that you want to you you're trying to establish yourself as a writer. You want to keep control of that. The ego won't always allow you to share that. And he's reached a place where that's obviously not bothered him at all on this album. So he's gone somewhere new on it. There is a kind of gentleness and melancholy to the album that I haven't heard before. And also in the way Paul sings now, I think he's got new things coming through. There's a new power there. There's a new force there in the voice that comes from being older and, and letting go of certain things. I think. And how long was this process of taken then to get to the song that ended up on the Melks Road Social um, album? And it was a single actually as part of the Wonderful Sound Singles Club, which was a great thing to get yeah. the post as well. How much back and forth was there on it? No, not hardly any. I sent him the thing uh, and he said, send me it without, the, you know, just send me the courses. And literally about an hour later, and then what's her name? And he was sort of mumbling the melody to the verses. And then he said, send me some lyrics. So I sent loads of lyrics. He used some and then he added his own. Real quick, real quick. Like all the best things, you know, literally a couple of hours. Brilliant. Wow. So there's a lovely bit which so Charles Reese and I chatted at the weekend. I was at Black Barn and we recorded a, an amazing conversation where like a bit like a biology experiment with, you know, dissecting frogs. We pulled apart some of the songs. We did a little bit on Rise Up Singing. So we isolated like the backing vocals of you and Leah Weller. And this yeah. kind of rise up, rise up bit. Yeah. Where did that come in the mix? When, when, how, how soon did you have, did you have that from the beginning? That's right at the beginning I had that. So I had my own, and then Leah, Leah they added Leah later. Um, I can't believe it. I haven't seen Leah since she was about a foot tall. Well, You've got two kids now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we, 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 we were living around the corner from each other when she was born. So my, my, my son and Joe, my son and Nat, Paul's son, are, are really good friends and still in touch. But yeah, that was part of the original thing that I had. 
that was the original kind of bit that that, uh, that was the hook. And that was kept. Your bit of that was kept then. So you didn't have to redo that or anything. No, they kept that. They kept Brilliant. that. Yeah, yeah. I've not actually been to Black Barn, although I, I am coming in October, I think. I think we're going to do something there for the first time I've been there. So it's all been via WhatsApp. Although I didn't record it. I've got a little studio here. I recorded it in, in here. But yeah, it wasn't in the same room or even the same country. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant though? <laughs> or even the same time zone. Yeah, amazing. Gosh. So the next iteration of it is Paul, like you say, wanting to take that further. And we're adding these lush, beautiful Hannah Peel orchestrated strings, Britain yeah. Symphonia recorded at Abbey Road. Did you get the invite to Abbey Road? No, I have recorded in studio too. I was signed briefly to EMI. When the Blow Monkeys initially split out in 1990, I signed as a solo artist and they gave me um, the budget to go and do an album. So I went into Studio 2 at Abbey Road. Meets the old budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I had the whole orchestra in there, everything. The album never came out. In oh. fact, the person who signed me left when Freddie Mercury died, EMI went into overdrive on Queen and blah, blah, blah. And my thing just disappeared, you know. I kept those tracks and sort of surreptitiously released them over the years as sort of extras and blah, blah, blah. So it was a, it was a buzz to be in that studio. But no, I, did, I mean, I don't, I sort of obviously I follow what Paul's up to and I know that I know that he uses Hannah and I knew he was in that studio. There was something special about that studio. Uh, about the way strings sound in there there's something there's something in the atmosphere that gives it something else and so that's got that that's added something very special that's there's like a layer on top that's that's atmospheric that you you can't really it's hard to describe and i'm finding it hard to describe but it works it's just uh, magic and then you then see this as another single. I don't know if you have record shop day out there where you are. We had to queue for this thing on Red Vinyl at like 5am in the morning in the UK to get Soul Wandering and Rise Up Singing, this sing- this double A single. Right. Yeah, I love well, Yeah, I love the record day. Yeah, I do. We, we, we've got some things because the label that we're signed to last night from Glasgow, they specialise in lots of vinyl and all that. So it's, yes, it's a... Uh... It's a big thing. I, I do follow that. Well, you say that they're the ones involved in the new Blow Monkeys album, which we're going to talk about, which you shared me a copy of just a couple of days ago. So I've been like cane in this thing. Yeah. Um, and it's a wonderful listen. And I've pre ordered the vinyl from those guys. This is a beautiful thing. What am I calling it? Because I would call it Together Alone, but there's a, there's a forward slash in the middle. No, th- what you just said is perfect. Together Alone. <laughs> With a silent slash. <laughs> <laughs> like in the middle of the night when you try not to wake, not wake anyone exactly. up. <laughs> so this is your first album post the global pandemic properly. The other one was recorded during lockdown. Yeah. And again, it's the evolution of the Blow Monkey sound. It's a it's 12 songs of just absolute musical splendor. It's a beautiful thing and, re- and really funky. I mean, so many grooves as always from you, but even yeah. this time around, it seems like we've dialed that up a level. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've done an awful lot of live work over the past five years and especially since Crispin Taylor joined us. Crispin drums with Galliano who have just played in the album. And Crispin is like, he's the only drummer I've ever played with who can actually play Funky Drama, which is the most sampled loop in the whole world. He's got that kind of, those chops. It's just something in his feel. And I wanted to, you know, the one we did before Journey to You was quite orchestral, quite big, quite quite what people might think is atypical Blow Monkeys in a sense, big production. This, I wanted to strip it down a bit, just have the four of us on most, apart from the Stranger to Me Now, there's no strings or anything like that on it. It's just the four of us. That was the idea, and to try and take things into places we hadn't been. There's this things called Rope Dope, which is a kind of 50s kind of do woppy thing. You know, I wanted to have a bit of fun with it and to kind of reflect what we do at our best, which is always in sound checks. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do songs that we're going to do in the set in sound checks. So we start things and we do cover versions of things and we have a jam <clears throat> and they're always the best bits. I was taping sound checks thinking, that's great, that those four bars, I'm gonna write a song around that because that's you know what I mean? Because they're not pre-thought out, they're just coming from a place of joy. That's the idea. Nice. I wasn't thinking too much about this in terms of the songwriting. I didn't try too hard. I just wanted to keep it simple and hopefully that, that came across. Here in the UK, it's um, it's a rare sunny day. So I had it on this morning with the sunshine and song. I mean, songs like there's a song called Cool Summer Hideaway. Yeah. It was like, oh, man, and I was like, hold on, I'm going to play this again and I'm going to turn out really loud. So I opened the doors yeah. to this garden office thing here. It's just, it's a sunshine album as well, which yeah. I love. Yeah. It's quite hard to write positive, happy songs without sounding tweet. It could go badly wrong. Think um, shiny, happy people. You know, it can, it, it, you know, I think... <laughs> It can get too pastiche It's a thin line, but I think part of the thing that I've learned is not to edit myself too much. Whatever's coming out first, 
go with that be brave just go with that and that one that's the kind of thing I might just sit around in the kitchen strumming on acoustic guitar while Michelle's cooking something lovely and because I'm feeling good and that, and I go no I couldn't possibly record that because that's too simple or whatever you know what I mean yeah. that might not have been my thought process before but hopefully you know a bit like Paul you sort of begin to in order to keep going you've got to kind of let go a bit you know, when you're younger, you're kind of focused and you're strong. And you're, I love that analogy um, about how, how you start off and you're kind of like a river and you're sort of, you're like a stream and you turn into a raging river. But by the time you get older, you're sort of going back into the sea and you become like a delta and the walls of the ego and all the things that you're trying to control dissipate and you let more in. And I think that's what's happening as you get older. If things are in a good place, that's what should be happening is that you let go a bit more. The thing about it is, though, that so maybe that pressure is released on both of you as artists, but the drive to create has not dissipated in any way, shape or form. Like the reaction to COVID was but for both of you was to kind of go again, let's make an album, let's make more music. I mean, I know this is what you do. And it's a, it's that thing of somebody said to me, like a carpenter would be making chairs, but not many artists who have been around in the industry and creating music for us listeners for as long as you both have are this prolific. You know, we are getting, and even like your solo years, the band, I know the, the split and stuff, we were still getting a lot of material from you. There's always like a couple of years between stuff, right? Yeah, I think it was important for me, especially in the early 90s when I couldn't get arrested, you know, on the back of the kind of 80s. And then you got Britpop and all that. I mean, I was I was working with Paul a lot, but I was always putting out stuff. Michelle always said to me, put stuff out. Doesn't matter whether, I mean, you know, subsequently people say, oh, realms of gold, they really like that or whatever. But at the time it was really difficult to kind of get things out. So it was just important to keep working, keep working. And then I came to live in Spain and I thought, well... I'll keep working, but I'm going to be an olive farmer as well. I'm going to be, I'm going to, you know, I've got, I want to live a life. I want to try things. I can't do any of that. I'm rubbish at that. I, I had to come to the realization that this was my calling. And I have genuinely thought that if it all fell apart, what would I do? Well, I'd busk. I started off busking. I'd go back to it. That's what I can do. Because I know that I could draw a little crowd and they'd put money in my coat or my hat and then I could pay my electricity bill. I mean, it's as simple as that. So... In the end, I, I felt that um, I have got over that hurdle of like, well, what else am I going to do with my life? I should try and taste everything. I should be this, I should do that. In the end, this is really what, what I feel I should be doing. And of course, now you're kind of thinking, um, oh, okay. I mean, I'm not quite as old as Paul, but I'm not far behind. And you think, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, there's still so much that fun to be had. You know, that's it. That is it. I'm not looking for chart positions or hit records or any of that. I don't, the whole culture has changed so much that those things don't really matter. But also, I'm not going to get those. What it's all about for me is, are there enough people for us to go out and play live? Do people, is, it, is there enough people to buy the record that will cover the cost of making the record? And are we having fun? And all those things are positives for me at the moment. So there's no reason to stop. And Paul talks to me about the the real love for him is in that creative process. The creation of it yeah. is the real buzz to the point. Yeah. That there's obviously, there's a massive delay between the delivery of the product now and it then coming out into the world. Yeah. Um, but is that the same for you in terms of that buzz is really in the in the creation of from nothing to something? Yeah. And I go a bit loopy if I'm, you know, like right now I'm working on something, a new album that we're going to kind of go back in um, in October to Black Barn. I'm like, oh, God, I haven't got anything. I haven't got anything. Ah, But actually, I do. And I find myself at sort of midnight in the bathroom because the, the, the acoustics in the bathroom sound lovely with the reverb and all that. I call on my phone. I get up the next morning and I think, oh, yeah, I can tell. That's, that's all right. This one's rubbish. That's all right. And suddenly there's a kind of buzz and the whole thing about, well, I'll get into my little studio. I'll do a demo. And suddenly what didn't exist exists a few hours later. Uh, it's kind of alchemy, really. If I wasn't excited by that, then it would be time to do the olive farming, I think. <laughs> but the sounds things I don't want to be tasting your olives if you know I know. Right. <laughs> we've got very good olive oil mate I'll tell you that there's no chemicals being used here <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about live performance as well I know there are gigs coming up this summer as well I think yes. three nights at the Pizza Express in London as well which I must get along to one of those but which oh, yeah, I think they're nearly not, sold out right but that's not, well yeah they're not very big but it's all the dough balls you can eat you know I like those gigs they're slightly strange when you've got people eating uh, they tend to stop eating after the first song. We do two shows kind of a night, really. There's an, we do an hour, stop for a while, then another hour. It's almost like cabaret. We often chuck in, you know, we did Witch to Lineman last time and things like that. We chuck in kind of things that, that seem to suit the setting. 
if you know what I mean. But I, I love those gigs, yeah, they're good fun. I should ask you, um, because Steve Sidonik was on the podcast a little while yeah. back, is he involved, and he was wearing his Blow Monkeys Journey to You t-shirt when we spoke. Oh, good old Steve. <laughs> is he involved in the making of the new album? He's not on, the, oh, well, he will be on the new one that we're going to do, but okay. not the one that's coming out in next week. No, he's not, that's just the four of us, but Steve is playing with us, uh, he's doing the Pizza Express. In fact, I think he's drumming with us for a couple, because... Crispin has to go and do Galliano because they've got a new album out. So, yeah, Steve's an honorary blow monkey and a lovely, lovely guy. You talk about the model changing, the industry model changing. And what we have had, I don't know, are these, would you, in your head, are these singles? Because for the, for the pre release for the album, we've had Strangers to Me Now, what would about back in February, which is the album yeah. opener, which is lovely. Uh, not the only game in town, which is just so, so funky, like really yeah. funky. And King of Everything. So, are these, yeah. a bit like Paul, you, you kind of pre release these tracks, but are they, what are they? Yeah. Impact tracks, singles? What are they in your head? I don't know what you call them, impact singles. I don't know. They, they um, you know, they... Testers? They're all, they're all, they're all available. Yeah, they're kind of testers. They like they go to radio. They're available for download, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, the model has changed so much that I don't... You're not going to rush out and buy the... You know, like I did, 50p at Woolworths. I love that. Sitting in that listening booth, buying the latest T-Rex single because they would look so great. And then on the way out, pinching a load of pick and mix and putting it in your pocket. I thought they were free. No wonder Woolworths went <laughs> But that that's gone. That culture has gone. Good times in a listening booth. I mean, we we that that was really special. I suppose it's different now. People don't listen on their phone. But I don't know. I don't know what the function of a single is anymore. I don't know what that means because I don't check out charts or anything like that. So I think they're just kind of they're tasters, aren't they? They're little hors d'oeuvres. Yeah, little they're little like, reminders that this thing is coming. Yeah, little yes. little sonic profiteroles that go out there. <laughs> <laughs> a phrase that people can choose from, you know. <laughs> As you said that, that reminded me. We used to when I lived in. I lived in. I'm using that. That's the title. Sorry. That's the next album. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. As you say that, it reminded me. So I grew up in uh, Landon in Basildon in Essex yes. when I was a kid, and our little local shop to get the records from was the Chemist. Yeah. <laughs> and you yeah. queue up, and I remember queuing up to get what would it Madonna get into the groove seven inch. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing like at the Chemist, but yeah, it was such yeah, a buzz. Right. I mean, that like seven well, inch, yeah. wasn't it? You know. Yeah, they were, in Kings Lynn, it was the same. There were all these. There was Woolworths, but there were some strange little shops that sold singles as well, you know, that you would go into. Some jewellery shop, I remember, on the high street. Had a little single booth that would just sell the top 20. And then all the those top of the Pops records were, they were done by, there were covers. They oh, were, yeah. And, but I used to buy them because they were only 99p. There's a really lovely song on there I wanted to ask you about, which is a song called Waking Up Is Hard To Do. Yeah. And it begins like a... I think this is a compliment. I hope it is. It begins oh. like a 70s sitcom theme tune. You know, like the yeah. very best kind of songs yeah. that's stuck in your head. Was that the intention? I'm glad you said that. It was going to be called George and Mildred. <laughs> really? Um, <laughs> in my, I, mean, I think that was the working title because I had that. Oh, yeah, it might be that. Where's that from? I'm sure I've nicked it from somewhere. But it's one of those 70s. It's, it's a kind of almost like a generic, yeah, you know, man about the house or something. Isn't it? Like, yeah. That's my favorite on the album, actually, that tune because yeah, I love the drums and the bass on it, you know, and then just push them to the front and just kept it real sparse. It's the self help anthem. <laughs> should have a, a, a quote from my cup toll on the end of it or something like that you know <laughs> have you had the chance to road test any of these new songs live yet yeah we have we did Stranger and we did King of Everything that sounds really good live because I get to do my T-Rex thing uh, but that, but it's you know it's got more of a kind of like a hip hop thing going on and it's just you know we're gonna we're gonna put quite a few more in I think we've got these Pizza Express and then we've got a whole quite a long tour in July and we'll put in as many as we can in there. I'd say four or five will sneak in because that's what it's all about, you know. I mean, that is, that's the other buzz, you know, seeing the whites of people's eyes when you, when you, when you say this is a new one, <laughs> you know, which I always love Paul for, you know, because he, he, he always does that. Yeah. He doesn't really care. Uh, and that's, sort of, that, that's, there's an excitement and a buzz in that. And that's proper artistry. That's being alive in the moment. That's the difference between just being showbiz and being an artist I think you've got to be brave and do that of course we, we play you know songs that we know everybody knows and all that and that's great fun as well but I'm looking forward to putting a few of these in it's so it's hard good. though because then yeah. it's also what are you taking out when you, and when you've got such a big bad catalogue you know yeah. you and Paul it's like what, what you, you've got to remove something to put them in yeah exactly I mean, Paul takes, he, you know, I'm like, come on, man, put Strange Town in. I want to hear it, you know, and he's not going to, and I respect that. Yeah, I respect that. So, uh, I, but I understand that is still one of the, you know, and that is one of the biggest buzzes about being a musician is 
playing live. I mean, I know I've said it before, but it is there is a moment, what they call in Spain, the duende, where you kind of lose yourself in it. And it's not about the guy on stage. It's a kind of communal experience. And that was getting back to what Rise Up Singing was coming from. That feeling of connection, which is very, it's addictive. You know, that, you know and it's, but it's not a bad thing to be addicted to. Yeah, I should say, uh, so you mentioned October, November uh, yeah. as being over here. Paul's out on the road at that point in the UK. Yeah. As of yet, he's not performed Rise Up singing in live, I don't think. I've not seen no. on any set list, so I'm just putting no. it out there, Robert. Well, I mean, I, I, don't, I think it might be quite difficult to do live. I'm not sure. Do you think I should do it? I might have a go. Um, <laughs> well, I really want to hear the original demo now. I have to oh, say. Uh, yeah. Well, I might put that up sometime, but that might be a bit naughty. Yeah, no, I, I noticed he hasn't played it uh, well, it might be because it's heavily orchestrated and it's, it's the kind of thing, you know, but maybe... Um, we'll it's see. Musically, it's quite complex as well from what Charles was telling me as well. I don't obviously, I don't really understand the structure of songs in that way, but he was saying the kind of how it's formed is quite complicated. Yeah, although it's basically only two chords, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it is quite complicated, yeah. But it's not beyond the, the ken to be able to kind of do it live, I don't think. I think it might come out at some point. Okay, well, that would be lovely. Well, yeah, but, you know, just putting that out there in terms yeah. of, um, you know, let's, let's, I'm at the Hammersmith on the Friday if you want to plan it around that. Okay, then. <laughs> All right, then. I'll have a word. On the eve of an album release, Paul talks to me about this and that kind of nerves because, you know, you're in it, you're deep in it, you're loving what you're doing, and then, but then yeah. at some point you have to let it go and you have to hand it over. And his, yeah. his phrase to me was, you know, shit, we have to put it out in the world. And it's like, what, what are people going to think? Um, yeah. Your album's coming out a week. So the time of recording, folks, I should say, Paul's album's out today, 66. It's the 24th yeah. of May. Your album's out next Friday. What's in your head at the minute about this thing about to go out into the world? Um, I, I, it's, I don't care. I really <laughs> don't, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't care what people say. I mean, whether if they review it at all, it's not, not important. It, you know, there are a few people that I really respect that, um, that are close to me that don't need to say anything. I can kind of see it in the way they react to things. But it comes to the inside. You know, I, I, I think... I think I've got to the point, and I'm sure Paul's way beyond that as well, where you a good review and a bad review kind of last the same amount of time. It's not really about that. You know yourself. You know you know inside. That's the, So um, back in the day, the 80s or 70s, the music press had far more power. I mean, I've heard Paul talk about it because he got a lot of flack, you know. Mm. Uh, and there's not many jobs in the world where you can do stuff and you get criticised so personally in public so that... Hundreds of thousands of people couldn't read it. Yes, you know, true. I remember the NME cover with Freddie Mercury on the front that said, Is this man a brat? I remember thinking, quite shocked by that. Whether you like Queen or not, I thought, God. So, that, I mean, I know musicians, <clears throat> friends of mine, who were brilliant, but couldn't take that part of it. The idea that you can then get criticized in public and that they can be as nasty as they want. Some people are just not built to take that. Mm. So, you have, to, you, have to, you have to be pretty. Tough. I mean, these days it's not so, you know, it's not, it's not like that so much, but it definitely was like that. Yeah. It's such a strange mechanism, the kind of scoring yeah. of albums as well, isn't it? It's so yeah. subjective and obviously it's about personal taste and there's so much music in the world and some of it we're going to love, some of it we're not. And it's, but when, when you don't, it's like, why are you the guy reviewing that? I saw something yesterday where 66 and somebody had gone like track by track, like two, 3.5. It's like, what is this? It's like a footballer performance rating after a match or something. It's so bizarre. Yeah. 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 Something about the anonymity as well of the writer compared to the guy that's putting it out there. So I, I, I think, first of all, yeah, there should be no ratings. There should be no stars. There should be no marks out of five. I mean, we, these are not exams. We're not at school. And who are you anyway to do that? Yeah. Review it and give your opinion about it. Sure, fine. And that's fine. But yeah, this whole marking system is just crazy, isn't it? Yeah, nuts, isn't it? Hey, look, it's so lovely to connect with you. Thank you for sharing your stories around Rise Up Singing, I'm the pleasure. new album as well. Uh, really look forward to that being out in the world. And um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure, Robert. Thank you. Dan, thank you once again. My thanks once again to Dr. Robert for joining me on the podcast. I'd encourage you to check out the Monks Road Social Project or the album so far and that original version of Rise Up Singing as well. And of course, compare the two. Play it on 66 as well. Plus, I've got to tell you, that brand new album from the Blow Monkeys is available right now. Together Alone is absolutely brilliant. Do check it out wherever you get your music from. And my thanks once again to Robert for joining me on the podcast. A reminder, if you've enjoyed this episode of the Paul Weller Fan Podcast, you can find a whole box set packed full of brand new episodes. The Story of 66, available now wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, 
YouTube, and more, or at paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Whilst you're on my website, why not head into our store, grab yourself a virtual coffee. It's always nice to get a little thanks for this free content. Much appreciated. All available online, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. And here's the big ask. Please do spread the word on social media. So many amazing people giving their time for free to chat to me on these episodes of the podcast. So I'd love it if you could spread the word. Facebook, Instagram, and X. Tell everybody about the story of 66, this celebration of the brand new album from Paul Weller. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.